when you really think about it, I mean, there aren't many people that do what I do or my colleagues do. And it is kind of a rare thing. I'm sure they probably were like, who is this girl promoting jazz? Like what? Like, <laughs> so. <laughs> and uh, the way that I kind of looked at that entire thing though, was what a great opportunity for the music. I mean, who can like me, I don't care. Like me aside, like who cares about me? Like I'm just a conduit to kind of open the door. I looked right. at it, you right. know, so it's like, it could be me or whoever, but right. the fact that it just puts jazz something of our world in the national consciousness, I feel like is always a win. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the New York Jazz Workshop Conversation Series. I'm Shizuka Shern, and um, Today, I'm very happy to have a wonderful person in the world of jazz with me, Lydia Liebman, who is part of Lydia Liebman Promotion. She is the owner and founder of that. It's just one of the greatest PR agencies where uh, I've been working in this industry for many years now, and I get a lot of stuff from her. And um, she's also been instrumental in really helping the jazz community. So we're gonna talk about that today. And she is also a big supporter of the LGBTQ community. So um, I am very happy to have her on. And uh, in, in terms of supporting women in this music, I think it's very important to feature people such as yourself. So thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Shizuka. This is fun. I'm excited to chat with you. And thank you for everything that you do, too, for the jazz community. The, uh, the feeling is certainly mutual that, uh, yeah, we, we've had our hands full over the years. <laughs> yeah, um, we've seen each other a lot at gigs pre-pandemic. And, um, you know, uh, you were aware of the unfortunate circumstance which happened in January. And as you could see, this is my new place. <laughs> really nice, it looks beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So the first thing I wanna ask you about is um, you just put on a fundraiser for the 55 Bar, which is one of the most iconic venues in New York for music period, not just jazz, but everything. Um, so talk about what inspired that and what, what the aftermath of that fundraiser was. Yeah, yeah, so a 55 Bar is first of all one of my favorite venues in New York City. I have gone to 55 Bar since I was a little kid. My dad has played there over the years. It's a wonderful venue and so important to the ecosystem of New York nightlife. Mm -hmm. So when Scott uh, called me um, to let me know that they were having, you know, they were having some issues because of the pandemic, obviously I, you know, jumped at the opportunity opportunity to help them uh, spread the word about the fundraiser that they were putting on. So uh, it was wonderful. Um, I went to see uh, Antonio Sanchez with uh, Miguel Zanon and Donnie McCaslin and Scott Colley the other night, and it was packed. And it just feels really good, you know, to see the community come out and support our own. Um, it's really important that we support the clubs in New York City. I mean, everywhere, but New York City is still, you know, considered the center of jazz in the United States, at least, and mm -hmm. if not the world. So we have to do our part. So it was really a, a lovely experience. I'm glad it went well. They raised some money. We got some nice press on it, and um, I think they'll be. I think that they'll be around for for some time. So that's a, a good thing. A good thing for sure. That's that's good. You mentioned your father. Her father is the legendary Dave Liebman, uh, the great saxophonist who has a new album out. Um, yeah, it's called Selflessness. It's out um, via Dot Time Records. It just came out on around his birthday uh, about last month. Yeah, I think I have it back here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to show it to everybody. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you talk about the New York ecosystem of, of, of clubs, and especially since the pandemic. Um, actually, I was watching Gene S's interview that he just did with Tana Alexa yeah. uh, for his Divertimento podcast. 
And that means Amazon Alexa is going to start talking to me. Uh, I muted her, I think. Um, oh, that, that's hilarious. <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, he mentioned that during the pandemic when he was in Tokyo, they still kind of were running clubs a little bit, but because of the situation now, nothing is running and it's kind of a dire circumstance. And uh, for New York, one of the biggest losses of the pandemic for me was the loss of the jazz standard. Yeah. Um, that was a club that I frequented a lot. Uh, for one thing, they were wheelchair accessible. I, I, think, I think the big problem with a lot of clubs in New York is their historic buildings and they're not wheelchair accessible. Totally. And I only have to, I can only go to a few locations, which is really, really frustrating. Um, but yeah, but the jazz standard was really a pillar of the community. And, uh, you know, so far Birdland's back open, uh, Smalls is back open, I believe. They're not accessible, unfortunately. Right. Um, and, uh, the Blue Note is back open. Uh, really, in terms of the big clubs, though, in New York, it's the Blue Note and the Jazz Standard. I don't know about the Catano or any of those places. Are they open? I'm not sure, actually. Um, I don't know. I don't know about that. I, I mean, I, I know Birdland is, of course, because I, I do their PR, so I can tell you that they're open. <laughs> yes. Uh, you yes. But um, uh, Smoke, Smoke is open, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, uh, yes. The jazz gallery is open. I was there the other night. Uh, there the cutting are, room. The cutting room is open. You know, live music venues, they're certainly coming. I mean, I think that those that survived the pandemic are open now. But yeah, the jazz standard, man, I loved that room. I used to go there. You know, the, the fun thing about the jazz standard is that I had a lot of clients that played there. But I also would go there a lot just kind of not for work. Um, right. One of my favorite concerts I'd ever seen there actually was Billy Childs doing his Laura Nero project. And uh, it was with um, Alicia Alatuja and Kate McGarry were, you know, were the singers and what a beautiful project. Like I, I had such a nice night not working, you know, just going to enjoy music. And I miss that. I, that was a really special room. I, I hope that um, I have, I've had a feeling that maybe not the jazz standard proper, but that Seth has some things up his sleeve. So Let's hope so. Let's hope. Fingers crossed. Yeah. And, and the food there, I think, was the best of any of the clubs. Oh, mac and cheese. I know. <laughs> the, the, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the beef brisket. Oh, man. Oh, so good. Was, I miss it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, last I saw you was at Central Park in May when Antonio was doing his gig with uh, Donnie McCaslin. Yeah, I think it was probably a similar, I don't, maybe not the exact group, but- uh, I think it was Matt Brewer on bass too. Matt, Matt Brewer and um, was Ben Wendell, Ben Wendell did a little bit, played a little bit too, if I'm not mistaken, right? They, yeah, he sat in on Inner Urge, yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, that was the last time that we saw each other. That was really nice. I love um, that series that that Jimmy Katz does. Um, I think that that was such a bright spot during the pandemic. And I frequented those shows quite a bit, actually. Yeah. And then I think you were, were you at the Pat Metheny Side Eye Show on Friday, September 13th at Sony Hall 2019? I was not, but um, no, hopefully then one of these days, I'd love to see Pat again. It's been too long. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually that show, there's a record that just came out. Oh yeah. You, you're, you can hear yourself in the background, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> it's uh, That's side awesome. eye, yeah, it's side eye NYC. This oh, is actually the, the Japanese version that has the bonus track. That's great. Well, of course, if, if all the people of all the people in the world, um, I would expect you to have that one. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, actually, let's talk about um, the the projects that you sent me the other day. You sent me uh, Gonzalo Rubicalba, Ron Carter, and Jack DeJanette's Skyline. Yeah. And um, you sent Brian Lynch. Uh, 
bus stop serenade, I think. Yes. The, the yes. story. The formal the, line. The album, yeah. Yeah, the formal title is the uh, it is the the Brian Lynch songbook bus stops. Oh, sorry, the Brian Lynch songbook volume one bus stop serenade. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I've I've been through disc one a few times. I haven't been to the alternates yet, but um, it's a great album. And then uh, I still got to listen to your dad's new album. I, I did interview your dad for this this series a couple several years back when it was just a podcast I remember. yeah yeah, I remember. yeah we should probably do that again sometime and i honestly think that if your dad was a history teacher instead of a musician he would have been dropping a whole lot of truth <laughs> right now <laughs> well, about the irony is that my dad uh yeah my dad was a history major in college um and you know he's been always very interested in all of that and yeah that's for sure he has plenty to say uh yeah you guys should definitely do a part two Definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. I don't know if he's aware that I transitioned or if he remembers me, but I'm sure he'll remember you. Yeah, mm. I'm not sure if he knows the details, but I'll oh I'll yeah, yeah. Tell him in. But uh, I'm sure, of course, he would remember you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that was a fun interview because I remember we were making fun of um how Tony Marino swirls his head around. Tony Marino can really swirl that. Yeah. Head. I don't know how it's still attached to his body. Let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> it is a trip, I'll tell you. Um, but yeah, you know, um, yeah, those three records I sent you, you know, I, I look, I, I try to be really um, specific when I'm sending projects to journalists. You know, I don't want to send something that I don't think is going to. Yeah, be yeah. Right. And I, I knew that you wanted the Gonzalo record. And I always, you know, you know me, I'm always trying to capitalize on every little moment. So I was like, let me throw in these extra ones. And I figured you'd appreciate them just because knowing, you know, what you like. And, um, you know, I, I figured you'd, you'd dig them. But those are all great projects. I love the Gonzalo project. My dad's, Brian's are so good. Yeah, I will definitely also be reviewing the uh, Jerry Gibbs at, at oh, some sure. point, too, because that's that is significantly... That's very important because it's Chick yeah. Corea's last recordings. So totally, you know, yeah, it's... and that's also a wonderful project too because it, you know honoring Terry Gibbs who is turning ninety seven. Yeah, a couple weeks are you know really soon, and uh, he's still with us, and he's sharp as a tack. He's so on top of it, and I think it's just really important to try to honor those people while they're here and while they're with us, rather than you know. I feel like, unfortunately, like we're losing people every day these days. Um, obviously, you know, you and I lost a mutual friend in Wallace Roney. Yeah. Long ago, unfortunately. And so it feels sometimes I feel like we are so quick to, uh, you know, we we are throwing the laurels to them when they've passed. And it would be a real, it's a real shame to not do that when they're with us. So I'm happy that Terry has this opportunity to be honored by his, his son and all of that. It's just lovely. Yeah. And also we lost Ralph Peterson yeah. as well, uh, which was very, very unfortunate because he was really in terms of passing down the tradition to a young generation. And I remember, I remember when he was, when he came on the scene and, um, you know, he and Tane were pretty much the two drummers that were doing like new stuff. And I think I think what a lot of the jazz media fails to acknowledge is that guys like him and Tane are innovators. Right. Um, Antonio as well. Sure. Obviously, Antonio is a big innovator because he's adding to the language in a way that a lot of people really haven't caught up to yet. Sure. Um, and I almost feel bad with the fact that I was so, uh, I was kind of down on the sound on that one record, that big band uh, record that I think it was Listen Up, I think was the name of the album. Um, yeah, you know, but that that was a really hard loss. But back to the Gonzalo Rubicalba album, um, you know, he and Jack, have played and and Ron have played in various contexts. Mm -hmm. And um, I heard my first Gonzalo album when I was 13 years old, which was Discovery Live at Montreux. I, I had gotten it for Christmas uh, because there was a buzz about him and I wanted to know what he was about. And, and what's so fascinating to me about this album, Skyline, is 
this is the mature Gonzalo Rubacaba. Um, you know, his Blue Note albums, for me, like his, if there's only one album that you can have, the one for me is Images Live at Mount Fuji with John Patitucci and Jack. I mean, that's- Sure, it's a classic. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, it, it, Ron and Jack and, and Gonzalo, this is them just kind of making an album. They're not really worried about radio airplay or anything like that. They're just kind of yeah. doing it. And um, I believe the album was available in Japan before this, right? It might have been. I mean, they um, they recorded this a bit ago and it had kind of been like, there had been some things out there. And uh, yeah, they had done uh, a couple dates, if I'm not mistaken, or there had been some things that had leaked out. And then finally, you know, this came out in September. Um, it is one of the projects that Gonzalo has really wanted to make for quite some time. And, you know, some of his earliest gigs were with Ron and with Jack when he was yeah. coming up. So to him, it was kind of like a, uh, kind of like a, not a reunion, but in a way it's just sort of is something that he really had wanted to do. And I just think that the final product is really great. I mean, it's such a, a really solid record. And as you said, it really doesn't seem like they're too concerned about you know, fulfilling anyone's expectations are just kind of like playing their ass off and sounding, you know, killing doing it. And the, the great part is that this is actually part of a planned series that um, Gonzalo was hoping to do. He's looking to do um, a couple more trio records kind of in the similar vein. Mm. I'm not sure if it's going to be with, I think it'll be with like different mentors or, you know, kind of along the same level, but different types of folks. And this is just the beginning of that. So uh, it's it's really, a, it's a really fun project. And um, I, I it's really also, fun for me to work with Gonzalo in this way because I worked with him last year on a project with Aimee Nubiola which is a uh, Latin total like you know super Latin jazz project is live at the Blue Note Tokyo and that was really different and so it's been fun for me to kind of now work on this side of things in the more jazz oriented space with Gonzalo and uh, yeah I'm starting to get to know him real well. <laughs> yeah actually that that album that you just mentioned I didn't I didn't even know that came out I'll have to check that out. Yeah, it came out of uh, the Enzo Tiempo is the is the, the actual name of it. And it came out with um, a label based in Miami called Top Stop Music. And it was nominated for a Grammy last year for uh, Best Latin Jazz Album. So, wow. Wow. Win, but, you know, I I think it, it gave a good run, a good run to those that to one, the one that did win, which I think was Arturo, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So, uh, and speaking of the Grammys, I believe you also did the PR for Tana's Ona album, and that yeah. was nominated. That that really won regardless. I agree with you. <laughs> just the just, you know, that album is, and I'm not saying that because she's just a good friend of mine, but that that's a really important album. And I think really? it's very empowering for us as Certainly. women. It's and, an incredible project. And Tana, the thing that I love about Tana is that she has a really clear vision of what she wants to do and she right. doesn't compromise on that vision. And I really appreciate that. And uh, I love that she released the album on her own so that she couldn't, or that she didn't have to rather uh, compromise what she wanted to do. Yeah. So I, I really respect that of, you know, respect that of Tana and um, she's just a great person. We've become really good friends in the process of all this. And I was just thrilled for her. And I, uh, to me, she won because that album is amazing and she did it on her own. You know, yeah, that, yeah, that is amazing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. for me, that was one of my favorite albums that that came out recently. And um, in terms of vocalists, there's there's really no one like her, right. you know, right now. Um, yeah, because I mean, there's so many jazz vocal records that come out. It's like so and so redoes the American Songbook or something, and after a while, those just kind of get to be tiring and those those kind of records I hate to say being an audiophile those kind of albums are the domain of audiophile labels and um, I'm not sure why they don't try to stir the pot a bit but you know Ona is is terrific and you also this is very big too Forbes 30 under 30 let's talk about that that's crazy yeah that was that was a fun thing. Also, uh, that was a real shock. It was a real surprise. Um, 
you know, the way that I, I the way that I see that, uh, it was really crazy for me to be on that list and to be there with people that are in positions of, you know, running like multi-million dollar companies, like, and it kind of, it, it for, me, for me, I mean, it, I felt so, I feel a little bit out of place. I mean, obviously just by nature, that's how I am. I'm like, Ooh. but, um, but then I, when you really think about it, I mean, there aren't many people that do what I do or my colleagues do. And it is kind of a rare thing. I'm sure they probably were like, who is this girl promoting jazz? Like what? Like, <laughs> so <weird. laughs> And uh, the way that I kind of looked at that entire thing, though, was what a great opportunity for the music. I mean, who cares? Like me, I don't care. Like me aside, like who cares about me? Like I'm just the conduit to kind of open the door. I looked right. at it, you right. know, so I was like it could be me or whoever. But right. the fact that it just puts jazz, something of our world in the national consciousness, I feel like is always a win. And I was really happy about that. And I have to say, like, it has opened it has opened the doors. I mean, besides, yes, of course it's opened doors for me and I'm grateful, but it also has opened doors for coverage with Forbes because it gave me a little bit of an, a little bit of an end for me to be like, Hey, like I'm working these projects that I think you should write about. And Tana actually was one of them, you know, yes. we were the premiere yes. video with Forbes that wouldn't have happened if we didn't, you know, if I didn't get the list, I think that right. really helps. Um, huge. huge. And same thing goes with uh, the, another, you know, an all female vocal group Sage which is um, fronted by Sarah Gazarek and it, well, not fronted, she's part of it along with um, Aaron Bentledge, um, John A. Uh, Kendrick and Amanda Taylor. The four of them are amazing. They were also nominated for a Grammy last year. And they also got an article with Forbes too, because I, I knew that that writer who did Tana would probably be interested in them too. So it's all about kind of like just using what comes to parlay it into the next thing. So that was kind of how I looked at the Forbes thing. It was great, loved it, but also it was just another way for my clients to get coverage. And that's kind of like in the end what I care about. So it was cool, but um, it was pretty nice. It was cool. You see your name there. Uh, the guy in my mailroom, I guess, is a fan of uh, one of the hip hop artists that were on the list. And he, one day I went to pick up my packages and he was like, wait a second. I like, I, what I saw your name. And I was like, oh my God, how do you know? He's like, cause your name was right under, you know, I don't know, whoever it was. And he was like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, yeah, that now it makes sense why you get all these CDs all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, I'm probably the only person in Manhattan still getting CDs by the box load, you know, to send to, to uh, <laughs> but it all made sense. They were like, oh man, I get it now. Well, <laughs> I'm, I'm very much a physical media person. So I think that CDs offer, and it, not to say I don't stream because I do, but to me, CDs are just a better, because honestly, and it depends on the equipment too, honestly, yeah. but the CDs generally sound better to me than even the high res streams when I'm streaming them on like Amazon okay. HD. Oh, yeah, I agree. I agree. Look, I, I have to deal with CDs because my job, um, you know, jazz journalists, a lot of them still like yourself, they still want to hear it on a, on a, you know, they want to hold it in their hands. So right. I have a lot of CDs around me. Um, so I use, I play them and I, I listen <laughs> to CDs still. Uh, I'm probably the only one. Um, and, uh, <laughs> but it's, you know, of, of my, of this world's, you know, few like you and I, but um, it, it's really like a no contest when it comes to the quality. So I right. feel you. I also listen to vinyl. You know, I, I'm always getting yeah. vinyl. I have a nice setup. I have to improve my speakers, but there's nothing like hearing it like that. Yeah, you got the the Louis Armstrong mosaic that that just came out not too long ago. And mosaic, you know, unfortunately, they're like they are one of the greatest companies, one of the greatest labels ever as far as box sets. And sure. You know, my first box set of theirs was the complete February 1957 Jimmy Smith Wow. Um, when I was 15. But unfortunately, like all the other stuff I owned, that unfortunately burned up. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, Mosaic, they're, they're kind of the products of a bygone era because they're their market is primarily aging and um, because CD is not what it was in the mainstream populace, they're, they're kind of hanging on by a thread. And 
the last, well, the first mosaic set rebuilding my collection that I just got was the Joe Henderson, um, the uh, Blue Note set. Yeah. They, they did a fantastic job on that one. Yeah. Um, I mean, that music has been available forever, but it's just a presentation. I mean, the booklet, that the, the essays that Bob Bloomingthal and other people do are amazing. And I've always, honestly, as a writer myself, I've always wanted to get in to, to something like that, especially if there's like a Jimmy Smith project, because I'm a Jimmy Smith expert. So I would really love the chance to write, you know, notes. If like Blue Note, there's any archival Jimmy Smith thing coming up, you know, I've, I've kind of put myself out there, but, um, you know, you mentioned a group called Sage. So I think for women now in, in this, this industry, it's, it's really the beginning of a golden age as far as women being recognized, because not only do you have people like Sage and Tana being recognized as vocalists and, and Yeba and all these other folks, um, Gretchen Parlato, but as far as instrumentalists now, there, you know, I think back to the days of when, when Clara Bryant, the great late trumpeter and vocalist right. made her first album. Yeah. Um, introducing Clara Bryant, which I believe was her only album. She was told that she couldn't play trumpet on the record because vocals are what's sold. So she maybe only had like maybe one or two trumpet solos and, and, and sang. And, um, you know, of course there were always women back in that era, um, Dottie Dodgen, uh, the, the great drummer, uh, Viola Smith, yeah. Um, there was, you know, Shirley Scott was obviously sure. one of the biggest yeah. names for women. Yeah. But as far as women instrumentalists now, I really feel like the playing field is is leveling. Uh, you know, with uh, Melissa Aldana just scoring a Blue Note contract. Um, you have Connie Hahn. Mm -hmm. You have, you know, obviously a uh, Camille Thurman, who actually went to my school, Binghamton University. Oh, wow. I actually met her back then, yeah. Oh, go, go figure. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. and, um, you know, you have all these women. So how do you feel about what it's like for us in the state of music right now in jazz? Yeah. You know, I, I do agree with you. I mean, I feel like, well, first of all, I'll back up and say that there are so many incredible women instrumentalists that, you know, one time I was, there's like a Facebook group that I'm a part of, unfortunately, uh, which is like many jazz, whatever. And, you know, someone asked like, oh, can you list like the female instrumentalists that you know of? And it was, <laughs> it was crazy. Like, I mean, some people were commenting the usual suspects, you know, of, you know the gents the, the Jensen Anchor Jensen or um you know Rini Rosness and right. you know, these folks have been around for you know for doing their do put their time in um and it was still a pretty short list that people were coming up with and I was like I cannot believe this so I like got myself involved because I why did I do this but I did and you know I listed I must have listed like nearly 100 or 150 I mean there are so many and something that I try to do on my own roster is I really do try to keep it as evenly split as possible. Um, it's really important to me to represent to have that you know split evenly if not if not 50 50 at least as close to it as I can get. Uh, I just think it's a really um, it's kind of just essential to to make sure that female instrumentalists and uh, you know female vocalists female musicians are given the same opportunity. Uh, of coverage as right. our parts, and also that that coverage is even and not coverage because they're a woman, which is right. very mm -hmm. frustrating where it's like, okay, I'm doing a female, you know, sax player roundup, like who, you know, do you think like Roxy cause would want to be part of this? And it's like, Roxy cause, yeah. it's like, yeah, I'm sure she would, but what, like, why does it have to be, oh, you're like the 15, you know, female sax players. Like, why can't it just be like 15 great sax players? And she's one of them. Right. You know? mm -hmm. And, and it's very hard because you can't necessarily 
avoid those things. I mean, we are publicists, we want to get coverage and we have to play games on how we can get that coverage, but it is kind of frustrating if that's sort of like what we're being handed. So for me, it's really important to get the narrative straight with our artists that they are great players who happen to be female, but the being female is not their only defining quality. So, you know, that being said, uh, I do think that things are certainly a little bit better than they were. I'm seeing female players everywhere. I am mm, yeah. like just last night, I went to go see a, a client, this pianist I work with named Gabriel Zucker. He's like on another level, he's insane, so good. And um, Anna Weber was playing with him, you know, mm -hmm. it was lovely mm -hmm. to hear her, hadn't heard her in a long time. She was incredible. You know, there are certainly, it's like pre it's female instrumentalists are present in groups and bands, but it's still not like, it's still kind of a novelty when you have like an all female group. People are like, oh, it's that all female group, et cetera. Yeah. And some people lean into it, like Sage, it's a big part of their identity and, and that makes perfect, you know, makes sense. In other cases though, there are groups that they just happen to be female players and that becomes the selling point and they don't want it to be, and that could be frustrating. So, you know, it's um, it can certainly be a challenge uh, to deal with that. Um, my whole thing is that I just want my female clients to feel that they're in good hands and that they're not going to be presented like, you know, like a sexified, uh, right. unless they want to be, in which case I'm all into it. Like <laughs> whatever the artist wants, but if yeah. they want to be presented that way, it's my job to make sure they're not being interpreted that way. And I also am really sensitive. You know, one thing that happens sometimes, like I'll get interview questions for artists and sometimes I get questions for my female artists that are just ridiculous. Like, what's your favorite fashion designer? Or like, what's your favorite shoe? And it's like- yeah, You gotta be kidding me, right? I swear. And it's like, if the artist wants to talk about this thing, there's no problem. Like, cool. I can talk about my favorite shoes for hours, trust me. But yeah. if, if they're bringing it into a conversation that is a musically driven Q and A, and then suddenly like, there's this question about like their favorite lipstick, you wouldn't ask a guy that. So what the hell? <laughs> Would you say that these questions are coming from old guard yes. male journalists? Yes, yes. And, and also, oftentimes, I hate to say it, a lot of the time it's not always, it's actually usually non-American journalists. It's European journalists that, I don't know. I mean, I don't know, I'm not sure why, but it, that is usually, what it is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate because I'm working on an article for New York jazz workshop right now about yeah. jazz and gender, and I'm opening it up to just women in general, um, because I've been trying to research transgender jazz musicians, and there's just not that many. I mean, there's Billy Tipton. Um, there's Jessica Williams. There's Jennifer, uh, Jennifer Lightman, bass player. Yes, exactly. There's also uh, Chloe Rollins um, of the Westerlies. And that's kind of, yeah, that's like it. That's, you know, and that myself. Of, that we know of. And that's that, that we know of. And, and you know, I, I don't mean to cut you off, but I want it, but I actually am hot on this topic because the other day, it's so funny, I was actually listening back to episodes of um, The Jazz Session, which is a podcast that I was um, a guest on recently. And I was listening back to episodes, a bunch of them. And I listened to an episode with Chloe. And she had said that, you know, um, she, uh, Jason Crane had asked her, you know, do you think that you are helping, like, do, basically, like, do you think that other transgender uh, musicians, you know, have, have they expressed how you've helped them and all of that? And she said, you know, sometimes not all the time, but it's very possible that I've spoken with someone who isn't out and I didn't know. And, you know, I'm sure that I've like, something like this, like I've encountered them just out and about and they maybe have spoken with me and I didn't know they were out and you know, maybe give them the strength to do that. And that's true. Like there's probably plenty that are, that are active and out there that aren't sure if they should come out. And I think that they, you know, we need to like make it known this environment is, that it's cool, like you can. And yes, I think the yes. more that we make that accepted, we'll be able to, I think you'll be seeing more because they'll become, you'll feel more comfortable coming out. Uh, so I, I yeah, I, this is hot on my mind because I was just thinking about this the other day and uh, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, I was very worried when I came out because I was thinking about, oh, how will this affect my um, ability to get certain interviews? Because you remember the whole uh, Robert Glasper thing, a number of, 
years ago where he made pretty nasty sexist comments that women in general, um, you know, jazz is still very much a male dominated male driven um, genre. And I feel also that, see, there's so much interesting stuff happening in jazz. I mean, you look at somebody like James Francis or, or Joel Ross and all of these cats who grew up in like Houston, Chicago, there's a new thing that's been going on. And I feel like a lot of writers, I don't consider myself a critic as such because I don't bash something. If I don't like it, I don't have an agenda to do that. Um, I think there's a tendency to not really want to look at what's happening right now. Um, and that's that's kind of a shame because I like to try to like review releases on my blog where I'm covering things that are happening right now. Um, and, you know, um, do you struggle in your role as PR to like get radio stations, magazines to cover things that are maybe innovative that? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, all the time. I mean, you know, it's, uh, I, there are a lot of reasons why things are hard to land sometimes. And yeah. going back to actually to the previous topic, you know, about being a female in this business. I mean, there are certainly times I've had where I'm pitching something where I'm like, I wonder if I, if, if a male we're pitching this, if, if a man were pitching this, I wonder if the reaction would be different or if it would get a more positive response. How sometimes, so? Well, it's just sometimes, you know, I, I once read this study where, I'm sure you've heard this because it's a common study that people have talked about, where uh, someone sent emails for a week um, with, a fe with, a, with a woman's name and then uh, she did it again using a, a male's, you know, a man's name. And the responses were, she got much more responses when the man sent it, which is interesting, you know? And sometimes I, I don't know, sometimes I feel like there is a little bit of like a boys club mentality, not just as musicians, but also in the industry too. Mm -hmm. And I get that, you know, I mean, yeah. these are people that have known each other for years and like they have a rapport with each other and I understand that. Um, but sometimes it can be frustrating. It's frustrating when I see sometimes like my male counterparts getting stuff that, or getting even just like responses about things that I've pitched the same thing or similar. And uh, it can be frustrating. And it's like, why is that? You know, I'm not, mm. I'm not saying that's just because they're a man, I'm a female, but I think that sometimes there's a little bit of that. I've also had things where like, I've had things said to me that are ridiculous, but I won't get into that now. Um, that's just absurd. But I think that that sometimes can be a little bit tricky, can be an uphill battle. Um, but for the most part, though, I would say to actually answer your question in the context you asked it, things that are innovative and new and, and, and different are hard to pitch sometimes because it, can, it, it demands people's attention. Mm, you know, right. Something that is safe and traditional and is something more in line with what they're familiar with, it's less work for the listener to do. It's less work for the critic to do because they've already, they already kind of know what's up. Yeah. When something that's new and innovative and different, you're commanding their attention to, to listen and to figure out what it means and figure out not just, you know, how to write about it, but if they like it and all these different things. So it can be hard. Uh, it's really hard if you have something innovative and new from someone that nobody knows, because it's like, they don't know who they are. So there's no reference point right. and exactly. something really out. And it's just like, the, to me, like the days of someone hearing something and it just grabs them that they love it so much that they're gonna be committed to writing about it are over. Unfortunately, because these overlords that run all these different outlets and are in charge have to make you know their subscribers, they've gotta make their clicks and all these, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Clicks, they're not willing to make it, to take a chance on something completely new and out. So unfortunately like that romantic, romantic is romanticization or whatever, the romanticizing of, oh, I heard something that blew my mind and I loved it. It's of course that happens. And I'm sure that happens with critics all the time. Will they get the opportunity to cover it in a grand way? Probably not because a lot of the time their editor is not willing to make that, you know, do that risk. So yeah, right, right. Got to be in for sure. Right. Like for example, I think one of the most 
you know, one of the coolest projects I've heard recently um, was by a band called Circuit Kisser that uh, Chase Baird is in. Yeah. And uh, Sam Shulinski, right? Yeah, uh-huh. And, and that is really one of the coolest things because not only is it tapping into something different, but it's also, you know, there's this real big, uh, it's so strange how there's this nostalgia for the 80s. Yeah. In our current um, <laughs> era, it's it's called retrofuturism. It's, it's because the 80s promised a future that didn't really exist. Interesting. And um, there's a genre of music called synthwave, which I've actually gotten into a little bit because I'm trying to figure out how to compose a track like that. But, um, you know, Circuit Kisser is an album faking the moon landing. People need to hear that record, but probably not a lot of people are going to check it out. And then Chase is the next in line as far as uh, bringing the iwi. Mm -hmm. um you know the next in line after michael brecker obviously and bob mincer yeah um, and even even i think bobby avey right or no 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 matt yeah. matt position plays the the he does. he does on the new... yeah he does some pretty incredible things on that on that instrument it's crazy but yeah chase is chase is a real uh and he he's he's a real treat um i work he's my music theory teacher by the way oh really oh that's cool yeah. oh, hey, it's been a minute. <laughs> yeah, yeah i did his album um his album that came out uh, a couple of years ago right uh, um oh my god i can't we did the interview um a life between thank you <laughs> life between oh my god yeah it, i remember um that was a great record i i love his sound and he's a great composer Oh, and, yeah. Um, oh yeah, you know that's and and I I've heard a little bit of his project with uh, with Dan. I've heard a bit of it, and I like it. It's different. It's innovative. It's cool. I'm into it. You know, I yeah. dig, I dig stuff like that. I, I I love that kind of thing. I I love when you can kind of I love when you can successfully bridge genres like that. I think that that's really um a really great way to bring people into jazz. It's kind of a a less scary way to bring yeah people. yeah <laughs> yeah absolutely I dig it. yeah. I mean, I hate to say it, but we're we're sort of out of time now and apologies to some people that i know mm -hmm. who are part of the the old school but we're kind of at a time where you put on a miles davis album like kind of blue or a charles mingus album it's not going to turn somebody on right away you have to find something see that's actually why like one of the big reasons like whenever my friends come over i put pat on because yeah. pat and this is funny. I have a very dear friend. She absolutely can't stand his music. She thinks all of it is corny, which I, I'm kind of like, well, you haven't really heard a lot of it, have you? <laughs> um, and like, you know, she said that if somebody approached her for like a date and Pat Metheny was the first person that they said that they liked because she was trying to help me with the dating profile at one point, she said she would have just like run. Um, you know which was hilarious but <laughs> Pat's music especially with the band he has now side eye with James Francis that's stuff that will catch people who maybe aren't um jazz fans because his music has always incorporated like everything oh sure Pat's a perfect example of that though you know and that's why yeah. it always makes me laugh like you mentioned that you know when someone says oh they don't like Pat Metheny I'm just like well like there's no way that you could just like blanket not like Pat Like there has to be, I mean, then you just, then you hate everything. Like, cause there's so many different facets of a career like yeah. Pat's where it's like, if you hate- Everything, everything is amazing too. His yeah, entire exactly. catalog is amazing. Totally. I mean, everything is different. And, you know, he's gone through so many phases musically that to me, when someone's like, I don't like Pat I'm like, okay, well, like you just have it. I mean, maybe, okay. You don't like the sound. You don't like the way it plays. You don't like this or that. All right. But like to say like, you don't like Pat to me is always like, it's, I'm a big David Bowie fan. So when yeah, someone yeah. says they don't like David Bowie, I'm like, okay, but like, what do you mean? Because there's so many different stages in his career. How can you say you just don't like it? So I, your friend is, in, well, your friend has friends, I guess, that I know that could chat because I have people. Yeah. Talk. Yeah. But, yeah. but but Pat is a good example of someone who, yes, he is a really safe bet, in my opinion, to bring people into the music. Um, I mean, obviously Pat's early stuff, you know, I mean, all, all his Pat Metheny group stuff to me is very accessible, but yeah. something more recent, um, I have not heard the side eye stuff too deep. I've heard some of it. I haven't heard it 
deeply. Um, I did though really enjoy From This Place. I, oh yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I love that record and you know, I not everybody loved it. I, I think some people thought it was a little too, not cinematic for them, but you know, a little too like whatever. But I, I love it. Like to me, like I love the drama. Like give me the yeah, drama. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Like, I want the drama. Give me the strings. Like I, I want the orchestration. Like I want it. Give it to me. I yeah, y- yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think, I think when that record came out, because I reviewed it, you know, I yeah, gave it a perfect record. score. Um, I think the biggest cop out that people had about that album was oh it's secret story part two just because of the string orchestra no it was totally no. different and i know secrets like secret story is an album that i of his in his catalog too that i'm well well versed in and yeah no yeah. it's very different and on but also secret story is a beautiful record i mean oh yeah i uh i love that album too i mean pat yeah i can pat is a one that has just had so many different lives in his life that you can find something to latch on to I feel yeah and I think I think also for getting people onto jazz Antonio's migration group is is perfect Mm -hmm. because he has this similar kind of ethos yeah um you know I think I think Chick Corea could be somebody that you can turn somebody on to although you know it depends kind of what they like because I mean people have so many opinions about his 70s and 80s work um and then you know i think maybe if you're just getting on somebody into jazz maybe mahavishnu orchestra is too heavy but something i want to go back to real quick and then we'll sort of wrap things up um you had mentioned that gone are the days where something somebody could come up to a critic and say, oh, I think you should take a look at this. If you think about like Monk, or if you think about Jimmy Smith, especially, you know, Jimmy Smith, the organ being a completely modern thing in 1956. Sure. You wouldn't be able to sell a critic on something like that now necessarily. Um, And even, (laughs) you know, I think Ira Gittler was the first person to sell somebody on Jimmy Smith and that's what led to Blue Note checking him out and then signing him like right after they heard him at uh, Smalls Paradise. Yeah. Um, And, you know, I I think, you know, and you have people today, I think, I think Connie Hahn is doing a bit to getting people into jazz, but once they hear her thing, my contention is that, geez, I sound like an academic. My contention is that they have to go back and listen to all of the early Wynton Marsalis and Branford records and all of the people of that time period because that's where that music is rooted. Yeah. Um, it, I mean, you know, and it depends on how deep the listener is willing to go. Right. And that's the thing. I, if someone is genuinely interested in this music and they find themselves suddenly and, you know, they heard something, saw someone and they loved it. And now they're like, oh, I like jazz, you know, and they they want to get into it. Like, of course, the the real pathway should be to go back and visit, you know, go back and 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 get the history straight. And mm, you know, yeah, Winston and, and Branford, but also to go back, you know, and, and really yeah. like, put in, and, you know, like learn the lineage. I mean, if you right. really care about this now, if you're like a casual listener and you just, you know, listening to whatever's on Spotify and, you know, you are going by the algorithm, then, you know, God bless, I guess. But yeah. I, I do agree with you that it's important to go back and to really, you know, if you really find yourself liking this music and you're unfamiliar, I agree, you know, to go back to, to where it came from, whether that be when in Branford, you know, Michael, whatever, like you want to go and into that vibe and then either stay there or work backwards to really get the history straight. Yeah, like if somebody likes uh, your dad's new album, they could go back to On the Corner or they could go back to actually the place to start with your dad. The place to start with your dad, in my opinion, is Elvin Jones Live at the Lighthouse. Lighthouse, of course. Yeah, that's, I mean, I agree. I, that's, that is definitely, uh, definitely an entry point. I mean, I don't know how many people you'll pick up if you start with that, but uh, I definitely think that that's where you're going to get, you know, 
the real deal. I mean, a funny story I'll, I'll tell you, like when I was growing up, I was not a jazz fan because that was what my parents did. And I was, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, but what I eventually, like when I kind of got my, my life together and, <laughs> and I was a teenager and I started to get into actually get into jazz on my own, not just because it was me being taken to the gig with my parents. Finally, it was, um, besides live at the lighthouse, it was actually the pendulum record with uh you know with Richie and uh, yeah and that was actually the record that the first record of my dad's that was back in the vault that I listened to that I was like oh I guess like my dad is good at this <laughs> <laughs> I was very like, good oh. like he's okay like he's cool um it's kind of funny that that was the one actually that kind of stuck out to me as one of my like one of the you know of my dad's of that stage of his career what what really got me and it's that funny you know it's you never know like it's so strange. it's so funny you mentioned that album because I've been looking for that pendulum live to village vanguard mosaic yeah. select but I can't find it because it goes for insane prices I know my dad's definitely got one. We've got one locked away somewhere. I could probably burn you an illegal copy. I have to see where uh, where it is, but I know we've got it here somewhere because my parents they moved and um, right ended in to New York, and I, I'm sure that one made the cut to make it to the into the actual bookcase that's in the apartment. <laughs> where we have it, if we do, I'll see if I can. Don't tell me. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so the last question I have is because I have an audio file friend, you mentioned you have a system. So what is it? I don't know. It's not good. It's like a Sony LP player with terrible speakers. I got <laughs> the Sony, the, the LP player itself is good. It's okay. Like it's good. It's fine. Um, but the actual, my speaker setup is like, is a mess. I need to get it together. I got these, like, I don't even know the brand. There's some, you would be embarrassed if you saw it. I'm sure you'd like throw up, but I got them from like a Best Buy or something off the floor. And, um, I spent money on the, on the player. And then with the ones came from the speakers, I was like, all right, I'm going to skimp on this and then like get it together when the time comes. So I'm actually in the process of getting it upgraded. So if you have suggestions for what speakers I should get. Yes, I do. As a matter of fact, <laughs> you can get a pair for, for uh 2200 for the pair pretty much i think um the speakers i have are by a brand in france vocal hmm. Send that and <laughs> yeah they're, they're yeah they're floor standing speakers and they make all of their parts in-house oh wow and um so the drivers are actually made of a slate cone fiber it's their latest technology interesting and they're actually like blue marble drivers like they look blue marble and they're like really cool looking um so yeah, i leave the, very, the very covers cool. off that sounds yeah. way better than the 115 dollars <laughs> speakers i've got off of best buy on 86th street like behind a tv that yeah was yeah you also <laughs> because you still use cd i highly recommend the audio labs cdt 6000 transport now if you hook it up to your amp or whatever, you don't get sound of it. You have to you have to hook it up to a DAC. Mm -hmm. And and there's a company called Shit that makes um really, really good DAC. So I have I have all that. That's the system that I was able to rebuild, you know, um after the fire. <laughs> you'll, you know, like you'll have to come over someday with Willie and you'll hear it and you'll be like, oh my God. I would love to. Yeah, I'm sure it's got to be incredible. I mean, knowing you, I know that you must have a very top notch setup. Yeah, I mean, the Gonzalo album, it sounds like the piano is right there, you know? Awesome. And it makes such a difference. I, my uncle uh, used to, um, used to live in Maine and I remember that we would go visit him and he had this incredible setup in the, they set up this whole like extra apartment area at the top of their home and Oh my God. I remember like the first time I heard something on his speakers, it was crazy. I mean, I really felt like I was there and it was, it's such a game changer. I was very young. And then another time um, we went to a family friend of ours. He's like this, uh, a doctor and he lives in Pennsylvania. And of mm -hmm. course he's got like the most insane. I mean, I don't, it's oh, yeah. he's got a whole room. I mean, he put on um, the Basie at Birdland LP and I felt like, 
I mean, I like felt like the spit was getting on me. Like it, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I felt like I was sitting right there and it was, so, it, you transports you. I, it really does. There's nothing like hearing this music on the right setup. And I, uh, I think it's worth the money and worth the investment, like a hundred percent. I think that's really, yeah. If you're into this music and you can afford the setup, like in some fashion, it helps. Because yeah, those uh, speakers from Best Buy don't cut it. I'll tell you that. Right. So, <laughs> where where can people find information about new releases that you are putting forth? I mean, I know where you can get the information, but tell everybody else where they can go. Well, you because you are on my email list, my secret guarded list that I try to keep real tight and only only let press get on there. But um, on my website, LydiaLeadman.com or LydiaLeadmanPromotions.com, they're the same thing. They are uh, updated pretty much every day. And I put new press releases up there every day. Um, we also put our reviews up there every day. So I, I keep it really current. Um, I'm also on Instagram at Lydia Lehman Promotions and also on Facebook at Lydia Lehman Promotions. So all those things. And um, we have a really exciting 2022 coming up. I'm super psyched. And then finishing up the rest of this year, I have new releases coming out um, from Brian, well, Brian Lynch, as you know, and, and Corey Weeds. I've got new wow. from Henry Cole. Um, it's just like, I mean, talk about drummers that are innovating. I mean, Henry, Henry Cole. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Like talk about innovative and you know, his new project is really great. So we have a lot of good stuff coming up and also things are opening up and uh, Birdland has a great you know schedule coming up. Uh, well, they always do, but even more so and things are moving. So yeah, we, uh, we keep onward, <laughs> we keep going and pandemic or not or new music keeps coming out so i'll be there to keep telling you about it for as long as it's coming out <laughs> yes so lydia liebman thank you so much for joining me for the new york jazz workshop in conversation with series i'm shizuka shern peace love groove and keep swinging everybody <laughs>